So uh, where we ended off last time, and I, I want to make sure that I, I say this. And so I'll, let's see. Um, uh, Zainab, are you here this morning? I am. Hi. How are you doing? Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. So, so the thing that I was um, getting at last time and see if this makes sense to you. So if we, we think about prices and quantities, they are really serving two different functions. My main point last time was that the quantity that ends up being traded in the market, um, that is what you need to know to figure out whether or not there's an efficiency problem. So what I mean by that is that if the quantity that's traded in the market ends up being the equilibrium quantity, then the first fundamental welfare theorem tells us that that's going to be the most efficient quantity and you're going to maximize total surplus. Does that, does that, does that make sense? Um, yeah, it does. Okay. So, but what does the price tell us? Cause a lot of folks focus on price and, and I think I mentioned this before, but, but why do you think um, when you look at a diagram and you see the equilibrium price, uh, because I used to tell my students, and I'll tell tell you all um, this too, that you know when you're an economic analyst, the, the price doesn't really matter. Okay, but why do you think it is that people tend to focus on price? Zena, because they. Have to purchase it. Yeah, I think you're right. So everybody that comes into this class, and I don't know if you can speak up a little bit and say that because I, I just heard you barely, so I'm not sure everybody else could hear you. Okay. Um, because I have to purchase it at that price. Yeah, so I think students tend to focus on the price because you all are used to being consumers, right? And we all know that the price is important to us as consumers to figure out whether or not we're gonna buy the good, we're gonna purchase it or not. And that is important, but as an analyst, remember price is really only secondary. Price only does exactly what you suggested, Zainab, is price tells us what quantity buyers and sellers will choose right so so it tells us um what what quantities buyers and sellers will choose and so i'm talking about you know uh quantity demanded and quantity supplied at a particular But for the analyst, that's just sort of like secondary information. And, and, and what I mean by that again is that if you're really um, thinking about this like a, a, an economist would, you realize that you want to be able to measure the efficiency of the outcome of a particular economic situation and getting the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied and then ultimately the quantity that's traded, which depending upon if there's a price regulation, there could be a shortage or a surplus. So either the quantity demanded or quantity supplied could end up being the quantity traded if it's not the equilibrium quantity. But so that gives us one piece of the information, but what we really care about is, and I'll put this in, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe a bright green color. 
Um, but what we really care about is we care about quantity because we need to know the quantity um, in order to calculate efficiency, right? And, and calculate efficiency relative to the maximum amount of efficiency or the maximum amount of total surplus. So I'll put total surplus is what we care about as the analysts, okay? So, so that's the main point is that, again, if, you, if you're thinking about this and you're trying to put on your analyst hat, right, as an economist, then sure, we note what prices are, but prices only tell us how consumers and producers are going to react to a particular situation. What we really care about is what quantity is actually going to be traded in the market and we care about that because that enables us to to figure out whether or not we have um, an efficient economic outcome or an inefficient one so quantity is the most important issue okay so so we were talking about price regulations so i'll be uh more concrete and I'll draw a couple of graphs, okay? So, so one of the things that, that we have to do first um, whenever we analyze these price controls or price regulations is we have to determine first whether or not the price control is binding or non-binding. So I'm gonna talk about the binding case first. And um, and there are going to be two types, right? There's going to be a price ceiling and um, a price floor. And just to be clear, the price ceiling means a, a legal maximum price, right? And the price floor is a legal minimum price. And let's draw the graphs, okay. Okay, so I'm labeling the intersection, the equilibrium in orange. And so then I'm gonna note uh, P star here and Q star here. Okay. And then, so for a, a binding uh, price ceiling, and I'll do this in purple. For a binding price ceiling, 
it has to be that um, the price ceiling is below the equilibrium price. So I'm gonna label this as P is P L for a price that's lower than the what the equilibrium price would be. And then hopefully everybody realizes that, that the idea of the price ceiling is that, again, it's a price cap. If the, the price was, was rising, it would be stopped by the price ceiling. Okay. So the, the next question is, okay, so what, um, you know, quantity is going to be realized in the market? And we talked about this a little bit last time. And let me see, I wanna do this here. Okay. So we have two candidates. Um, we have a, a, a quantity demanded at that price and we have a, a, a quantity supplied at that price. So here and here, right? But we also know that there's gonna be a shortage that the quantity demanded is gonna be greater than the quantity supplied. So um, sellers, and I'll put this as QV, are gonna wanna sell that quantity, right? And uh, buyers are gonna only wanna, are, are gonna wanna purchase more, right? And since the regulation just simply caps the price, if sellers want to sell a smaller quantity than buyers want to buy, then, then QV is going to be the actual quantity that's traded. Whatever sellers are willing to supply that price is what's going to be in the market. And then um, what we want to do next is we want to go ahead and... Um, begin to, to measure the total surplus. So I go ahead and am taking the line up there because at this point, we should be in pretty good shape in the sense that if we wanna look at total surplus, we know that total surplus is always gonna be the area that's below the demand curve and above um, the supply curve and to the left of the quantity traded. So can you see this uh, yellow trapezoid, Zainab? Yes. Yeah. So, and what's the amount of um, efficiency that's lost or the total surplus that's lost relative to the equilibrium quantity. Can you see that? Yeah. What, what, how would you, how would you um, label it or, or highlight it or whatever? Where should I it's color in? Like, it's that triangle. Yeah, so this is, this is our dead weight loss triangle or our loss total surplus as a result of, of the price ceiling. Okay, good job. So the one other thing that I wanna I wanna note is that um, this area of, of total surplus, I don't know if you can see it it it, it clearly or not, but um, it can be broken up into a consumer surplus and um, 
producer surplus. So can, can you can you see that? So so this is our total surplus here, right? Um, but we haven't divided it at this point between the buyers and the sellers. Do you see what I mean, Saint Anne? Yeah. Yeah. So so which part would be uh, the consumer surplus under the price ceiling? And, and which part would be the producer surplus? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. So, so I'm going to um, go ahead and maybe this will help you out, okay? This is a, a graphical um, explanation of producer and consumer surplus. So consumer surplus, and maybe it's better if I put this in. Okay. So consumer surplus on a demand and supply diagram is always the area, okay, below the demand curve and maybe I'll I'll draw this out this way one below the demand curve Two above the price the consumer pays, and three to the left of the quantity. by the consumer. Now, I, I put a little asterisk there because um, you can have a quantity demanded and a quantity supplied, right? Um, but here, when I say quantity demanded, right, it, it could be that the actual quantity of the consumer um, is is less than the quantity demanded, right? Because if the the suppliers are um, are not supplying their entire quantity demanded, so so it, it's better to say um, to the left of the quantity traded. Okay, but I just want to be clear. You want to make sure that you understand what's actually happening in the market, um, not just what the consumers want. Okay, so I don't know if that is helpful, but we'll talk about it a little bit more. But then the producer surplus on our graph, likewise, it's gonna be an area and it's always gonna be above the supply curve below the price the seller receives and to the left of the quantity. So now let's go ahead. So I don't, I don't know if, if um, you can remember these definitions um, or these 
you know, graphical definitions. But let's just concentrate on the first one, the area below the demand curve. So let's look over here. Okay, you with me, Zainab? Yes. Okay. So here's the demand curve, right? Yeah. And we're looking to the area below the demand curve, which means it's got to be down here someplace, right? I mean, these are all candidate areas. I'm just pointing this is all below the demand curve, right? And then the the second part says above the price the consumer pays. Well, here, what price is the consumer going to pay? Um, is it PL? Yeah, they're going to pay the, the price ceiling price because the price ceiling is binding, which means that's the price they're actually going to see in the market. So remember, you know, if you want to come up with a good example of this, um, and we don't do this anymore, but, you know, this has been tried a, a, a couple of times. I don't know if you ever heard that in the 1970s that the U.S. Um, government capped the price of gasoline. Did you hear, have you heard that? I think so, yeah. Yeah, and it was a horrible situation, but they did, they, 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 they capped the price of gasoline. And so um, that's an example of a, a, a binding price ceiling. But um, yeah, so that's what you see when you would go to the, the, the gas station is you would see the government issued price. You wouldn't see, you know, different, gas stations charging different prices, they were all charging exactly the same price, which was the government mandated price for gasoline. So yeah, that's the price that if you could get gas, because there were a lot of shortages as a result of the, the um, price caps, but that's what people actually paid. They paid the, the price cap price. So it's below the demand curve above the price consumers pay. And remember the last part is to the left of the quantity traded. So what's going to be the quantity that's traded? Is it it's QV? Yeah. So we know suppliers only going to supply this quantity. So that's the most that the buyers can buy. So can you see it's this area below the demand curve? to the left of this quantity and above that price, that's gonna be the consumer surplus area. Um, and I'll go ahead and do this. I'll outline it. It's gonna be this trapezoid up here. Okay, so that's going to be the consumer surplus. And then we could do the exact same analysis, but I think you could probably see what part is going to be um, the producer surplus now, right? And so I'll just put a little label down here. Um, oh, PS, that little triangle, because we know the, the total surplus is the consumer and the producer surplus combined. Okay. So do you have any questions about that, Zainab, or do you feel pretty good? Um, I feel good. Okay, okay. So I'll now draw um, the price floor example.
Okay. So for the the price floor, um, again, for it to be binding, it's in some ways you could say it's the opposite case of the price ceiling. Um, it has to be above the current equilibrium price. So I'm just gonna put PH for a price that's higher than the equilibrium price. And remember um, what's the you know price floor regulation is a the price floor regulation says that right prices have to be above a certain level. Okay. And then again, um, we can go ahead and look at the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied. under the price regulation. Okay. So then again, um, the next thing that we would want to do is so in in this sort of situation and i'll say jeffrey lee how are you doing this morning i'm doing great you okay i'm pretty good pretty good i haven't had my second cup of coffee yet but i will before too long um so here um again we're interested in the issue of of, of you know efficiency, so we have to find what quantity is going to actually be traded in the market, and what's your your suggestion? What's actually going to happen in this market? Uh, price floor. I don't know. Okay, well, well, work work this out, right? So. Remember, the price floor is a legal minimum price, right? Mm -hmm. And do you, you know, what's the best example of, of a price floor? Like real world. Remember, it's a minimum. So there's a hint. What's a minimum price that you're familiar with? Uh... Uh, I'm blanking right now. Sorry. Okay. I'll give you a hint. Yeah. It's $15 an hour. Oh, minimum wage, right? <laughs> right. Wages are a price, right? They're, mm -hmm. what are they a price for? A price for labor. Yeah. It's a price for labor, the labor market, right? Now, who are the buyers in the labor market? Uh, buyers would be employers. Yeah. Businesses, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I mean, primarily businesses. It could be government agencies employ people too, but we will leave them out. <laughs> so, because <laughs> they're not they're not the private sector, right? They're not dealing with with having to to pay for the cost of the goods that they produce. So, they're being funded by tax revenue. So, their situation's different. But private sector employers are on the the demand side in the labor market. Um, so so. Um, and who's on the supply side? Uh, the workforce. Yeah, us, right, workers. Um, we're offering our labor for sale to the businesses and the businesses are deciding whether or not to buy it. Now, uh, I I'm gonna ask you to try to imagine something because it it's really, really hard um, you know, with inflation to, to know um, whether or not the current minimum wage is really um, above what the equilibrium wage would be. It really depends upon the market that you're in. Um, and I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but 
but in places like Oklahoma, um, where you know they're just subject to the federal minimum wage, which I don't know what it is right now, but last time I looked it up, it was like seven dollars and seventy five cents an hour. A lot of people there are happy to work for minimum wage because the cost of living is so much cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. And in places like San Francisco, um, you know, they've been at $15 an hour. I think they were one of the first cities to adopt a local minimum wage of $15 an hour. And um, there, by the time they adopted it, a lot of people in the city were already making $15 or more um, because the cost of living is so much higher right? So if you think about yourself, if you're a restaurant employee in San Francisco, um, you're probably living in a nearby community, but you have to commute. And so if you're in some place like, I don't are you familiar with San Francisco at all? Uh, I've been there a couple of times. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard of like, you know, any of the areas around there, like Oakland or Daly City or any of those places, but you might, you might work in San Francisco and then live like in a community that's next to it. Mm -hmm. But then you've got to commute and all the rest of it. And, and um, anyway, so to work as like a, a waiter or a waitress or a busboy or something that's like a minimum wage occupation, uh, you're not, not considering tips necessarily, right? Um, in San Francisco, you probably don't live in San Francisco because the rent is just too high. But the places nearby might be affordable, but then you've got to commute, right? So, so a lot of those people were already making fifteen dollars an hour. So, so there's a big question of whether or not fifteen dollars an hour is a binding minimum wage uh, in places that have implemented it, because in order for it to be binding, it has to be above what employers were paying before the the, the minimum wage ordinance was passed, right? There has to be somebody who gets a higher wage as a result of the minimum wage, or it's just not binding. Uh, does that make sense, Jeffrey? Uh, yeah. So I'm going to ask you to imagine something else, right? Imagine a minimum wage of $30 an hour. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, or you could pick another number. What number do you like that's higher than 15? <laughs> uh, I don't know. We could go with 30. <laughs> I mean, I'm just picking, you, know, you say $50 an hour if you like, right? you know, I always, I always play with my students when I talk about the minimum wage because you know, it's, it's kind of like ingrained in the culture a little bit. And, and, you know, to really be dispassionate about these things, you have to lay everything out on the table and, and, um, you know, get rid of your preconceived biases and, and, and the rest of it. But a lot, a lot of students, when I say, well, you know, I mean, basically it, the implication, I mean, if you actually, and you should ask yourself this question, this is kind of like a, a question for, for Riley Patrick in particular, because, you know, he was sort of a, a, a staunch defender of rent control um, last, last time. Um, but the, the question, if, if you're going to try to think about these things as an economist is to say, well, if I know it's inefficient, uh, why do I not care? And if the answer to that is because you don't care about efficiency, well, then, you know, you need to think more deeply about what efficiency means and why it's important uh, or why it's not important. I mean, that's all we do in our discipline um, primarily is like we figure out what's the equilibrium going to be. In fact, one of the things that I've often told students is that, you know, your job, so the, the economist's job description simply put is is this um, you only exist to answer two questions what is the um, prevailing price and quantity um, and so a lot of times uh, I'll state this as find the equilibrium. So you have to be able to describe the equilibrium. That's 
job one, describe the equilibrium. So what, what price and what quantity, right? So find, find P in Q for a particular situation. And the second part of the job description is measure the efficiency of the outcome. And normally this is, you know, relative to the maximum um, total surplus available. That's it. Um, uh, maximum total surplus available. So, 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 yeah. I mean, if if you want to put it really succinctly, if you think about all the problems we're solving, um, right? You find P and Q, and then you find the associated total surplus. Right, I mean th that's all that economists do. I don't, I don't know if you disagree with me or not, Jeffrey. But if if you come up with something else that you do as an economist, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> right, but that's all I see. All my colleagues and all the classes that we teach, whatever they are in the upper division. Um, you know, I teach a research class and some people may be enrolled in that that are in, in this class. It's better to take it after this class. But but basically the, 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 the research part of it is sometimes we don't know what the P and the Q are going to be in a certain situation. And so we're doing some investigation to kind of find out what they are. And sometimes there are subparts to finding P and Q. But, you know, we just find P and Q and and then we measure efficiency and that's all we do so you know if you're an economist and you don't think that efficiency is really important then you need to find out kind of like well what should our discipline be doing besides what we are doing that's a good question um but yeah we just you know measure you know predict you know what's going to be the price and the quantity in a given situation and we predict what are going to be the impacts on efficiency. That's it. That's all we ever do. Um, so, so here, right? So, Jeffrey, if this was the labor market, and let's just say, for example, that, and I don't know if you if you agree with me or not, but I'm happy to change the numbers. Um, but let's just say, for example, that the equilibrium wage would be 15. Like that's what employers would be paying anyway. So what, what do you think would be the, the equilibrium wage if there was no minimum wage? Because that's really what this should be. I'm saying I think it's 15. Do you have another uh, suggestion? Uh, I don't know. So we can just go with 15. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to put any number here, but like I said, there are a lot of um, analysts that have looked at particularly, again, high cost living cities like San Francisco or Santa Monica that, that were the first to implement these, uh, you know, higher minimum wage uh, laws. And they said, well, everybody was already making $15 an hour anyway, or really close to it. So, so it really didn't impact the price of, of labor. But for this one, we wanna make sure we pick something higher. So um, I'll pick 30. And I also, what I say to students is, so does anybody have a good argument? And, and I just wanna hear the argument. And even if you don't think it's good, um, it could be a common argument. What's a common argument for a minimum wage. Does anybody have one? What do you hear, normally hear people say? I don't know if you guys have seen the signs like the fight for 15, you know, it's got a nice ring to it. Anybody? There must be somebody here who, who, who wants to put forward a, a, an argument. Taylor, how are you doing this morning? 
I'm good. How are you? I'm I'm doing um, very well. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so 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 Taylor, what do you think about a minimum wage? Um, I mean, I'm glad that it's going up. I think that it's important for people to feel financially stable, especially when they have dependents. Yeah, so so that's that's good. But what's the right level for the minimum wage? What would make people feel secure enough? Um, well, I saw a calculation <clears throat> where people were breaking down like what a living wage actually is. I and love it. The example that they used was a single mother of one, okay. and how um, I forget what the minimum wage example was but it was it was either 15 or less well so yeah so so ha have you ever done the calculation you know like if you work a full-time job no i work part-time well, well no but i'm just asking you this right so so oh. if, if somebody works a, a full-time job right they work 40 hours a week mm -hmm. And they're 52 weeks a year, but you normally get like two weeks off for vacation, even if you're just including like regular holidays and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. So so you would normally work uh, 50 weeks a year times 40 hours a week would be 2,000 hours um, a year. So at, at 2,000 hours a year, um, you could do the math pretty easily, right? So $15 an hour translates to an annual income of, well, 15 times 1,000 is 15,000, right? So 15 times 2,000 is $30,000 a year, mm -hmm. right? Now, think about California and... and um, do you think that folks can make it on, if you were a single mother, could you make it on $30,000 a year in California? I mean, not in like the big cities or anything. So like, yeah, like where would you, because you have to be able to work someplace too. There may not be jobs out in, you know, Death yeah. Valley. <laughs> then no. Have you, have you been to Death Valley? It's not much out there. <laughs> Have you been to Death Valley? Or I don't know. Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. So it's a good time to visit. It's not quite that hot this time of year. Spring is the best time. But um, so, so yeah, like maybe in the outskirts of San Bernardino or whatever, you think you can make it on 30 grand. I, I say that, you know, if you ask me is, is $15 an hour, uh, a living wage in in California, I say no way. You know, I I couldn't make it on thirty thousand dollars a year. Um, but does anybody wanna wanna chime in? Do you guys? Does anybody else think that thirty thousand dollars is a uh living wage in California? No. Uh, I'd like to chime in. Um, yeah. Uh, obviously, $30,000 isn't much, but I think looking at it from, it's like the bare minimum. This is like, these are jobs for like college students that are still building their- But what about the single mom, Omar? Oh, okay, I, I do understand that, but I don't know. I, I think about it more from that aspect where it's like, it's like, the I don't want to be rude, but it's like the lowest of the low job. Obviously, every job is valuable, you know. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to sound rude right now, but like the, this is how I view it. These are like McDonald's, like like yeah. You 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 sound so stingy, Omar. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, but I mean, like hard. like like. Like, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to try to make it on 30 grand in California. Oh, no. Obviously, I no wouldn't way. want to make it on 30 grand, which is why I encourage everyone to pursue a degree and a career so they can. But single mom, it's so hard for her. Come on, Omar. <laughs> I 
I, I do yeah. understand that. But. Yeah, or single dad. Hey, you know. but like, uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, like I said, I do understand the both. cost of childcare alone. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm just giving you a hard time, Omar. But what, what I'm trying to, to get at. So I, I always say, like. It shouldn't be fifteen dollars now. If you're really talking about like a living wage in California, like it should be at least thirty, because that would be sixty grand a year. Then you could start to make it. I think that if you you make less than a hundred thousand dollars a year, which would be fifty dollars an hour in California, then you're what I call California poor. Um, you know, I mean, it, 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 honestly, to to make it on less than $60,000 a year in California is, is tough. I don't know. What do you think, Taylor? Do you agree with I me? agree. No, I agree yeah. that the minimum wage should be higher. Yeah. But I'm trying to get you to like, think about it, like holistically. Do you, do you, do you think 30 sounds right? I think 30 sounds a lot better than 15. And what about 50? I mean, that sounds better than 30. Yeah, what about $100 an hour? For then, minimum? then we're actually talking, yeah, because if, if $50,000, $100,000 a year in California, that makes you, you know, just like kind of like doing okay. But, mm -hmm. but if we made it $100 an hour, then the minimum anybody would make in California would be, you know, like $200,000 a year. There, I think you can actually begin to live. But how would that not like factor into inflation if everybody? Oh, see, you didn't even. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you noticed or not. So, so you're saying that there might be an impact on the cost of burritos at Del Taco if we were paying the people <laughs> over there $100 an hour. I might not be able to get my, my 99 cent bean and cheese burrito. Basically. Ah, uh, oh no. I'm gonna have to go rethink this then. Yeah. So actually, just as this, just an aside, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, um, being uh, facetious for effect to to get you all to think about this stuff. You know, it's really easy to think and say, ah, you know, fifteen dollars an hour. Yeah, people at least deserve that. And then to think like, oh, well, there's not going to be any impact from inflation. But if we go from fifteen to thirty or thirty to 60 or 60 to 120, we've doubled the wage each time. There's gonna be an impact on inflation. If we go from seven to 15, we've also doubled the wage. There's gonna be an impact on inflation. There's gonna be an increase in the costs, right? For businesses. So, so I, I, think, I think sort of um, the thing that we all need to be careful about as economists is, is that you know, imagining something that seems familiar to us, meaning like, oh, around $15 an hour, that that's not having the same type of impact as something that's unfamiliar to us, right? Oh yeah, well, going to 30 or going from 30 to 60, oh, well, now we have to worry about inflation. And in fact, I don't know if, if you all have kept track of the statistics, it's more my job to do it than yours, but I do recommend that all of you, um, you know, regularly read the Wall Street Journal. Um, they have a nice um, little email that you can sign up for where um, they'll give you all the like, latest statistics on inflation and employment and stuff like that. But actually, even though um, minimum wages have been going up because of the price increases that we've seen in the last year, uh, real wages, meaning the purchasing power of, of workers, has gone down by about 4%, even though we're paying more. Now, I'm not going to say that it's a slam dunk case, that that's all because of increased cost of labor going into increased prices that businesses are having to charge, but that's part of it. So let's go ahead and, and go back to... Um, this story, and um, I was talking to Jeffrey in the very beginning, and and thanks for for uh, um, your input, Taylor, and I forget who else was helping us out, and Omar, 
I don't know if anybody else has a, a comment, but I want to head and finish up this analysis. Um, Jeff, are you still there? Yeah. Yeah. So if we go from 15 to 30, um, what we can see in our diagram, right, is that businesses, right, before at the equilibrium, Q star was equal to the amount of here the quantity is hours of labor or employees number of employees right at a, the price of 15 the um amount of people that wanted to work and the amount that employers wanted to hire was equal to q star can you can you see that yeah saying he, here we get that so qb at P star is equal to Q star and QV is equal to Q star. So we have a match. There's no, um, what we would call uh, an excess supply of labor or unemployment at P star. Everybody that wants to work can find a job. But at PH, right, we notice that a lot of people want to work. You know, I mean, just imagine if we suddenly change the minimum wage to $3 an hour, how many people would be out looking for a job, right? Yeah. That might otherwise be sitting home at, you know, and deciding not to participate in the labor market, not be looking for a job, right? And, but businesses are doing, you know, what, what Taylor was getting to, which is like, oh my gosh, um, at $30 an hour, I'm not sure I can produce a product where somebody's going to want to come in to my Del Taco and buy a bean and cheese burrito for $4, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's always a substitute for labor in the labor market, right? You can stay home. I mean, if, if bean burritos, which is what I normally get, I get a bean and cheese burrito with green sauce. Um, you know, if, if bean burritos were $4 instead of a dollar, what would you likely do? I know what I would do. I mean, I wouldn't buy it. <laughs> yeah, instead, how would you eat? I would make my own food. Yeah, I'd make my own burrito. <laughs> and I've done that before. It's pretty easy. You need to go down and get the beans and put them in the crock pot or whatever. And, um, you know, you can make pretty good bean burritos at home. So, yeah, if, if people decide that the price is too high, they just won't, won't buy it, right? Um, some businesses would probably survive, you know, I mean, it might be that for a burrito bowl at Chipotle, um, instead of paying 10 bucks, you might be willing to pay, you know, close to 20, some people, right? But, um, you know, there would be lots of businesses who didn't want to hire because they didn't think that they could cover the cost of the labor, right? So my question to you was, well, what quantity will actually be realized in this market? Uh, and it would be, right, it would be the quantity demanded, right? The quantity supplied is in excess of the quantity demanded, but you can't force buyers to buy what they don't want to, right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so, so. I'll just go ahead and put a little circle around it, but 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 this would be the quantity that we would see traded in the market if we had a uh, a binding price floor. So so then the next question is okay. So we found our um, we found our price and we found our quantity and then <clears throat> I don't know if I can erase this one. It's been giving me a hard time when I want to erase stuff. I'm just going to move it over here. Okay. Um, but then the next question, right, is efficiency, right? Because we always said we have these two questions. We want to find the price. We want to find the quantity. We did that. Um, now, how do we measure our efficiency? Can you, can you see it? Jeffrey? 
Uh, yeah, the total surplus. Yeah. So, yeah, that tiny triangles are consumer surplus. Okay, so you identify the consumer surplus. Mm -hmm. And and what about the the uh, the producer surplus? It's that like big trapezoid underneath. Yeah. So so the total surplus is going to be all the area between the demand and supply curve, right, up to the quantity that's actually traded, right. So there's this there's this big trapezoid, this total surplus, and you were talking about the breakdown between the two, right. Mm -hmm. And then can you see the area of of lost total surplus? The, yeah. the the dead weight loss. Yeah, it's the triangle right next to it. Yeah. So so we give up all of this. Right. Okay. And then we have to talk about this breakdown. Right. So let's go ahead and 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 do what we talked about before, which is let's look at these graphical definitions. So producer surplus is the area above the supply curve, right? So um, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, so here's the supply curve and see all of this is area above it, right? All of this, this is above the supply curve, right? Jeffrey, you agree? Yeah. That's above the supply curve. That's above the supply curve, right? And then the next part is, so above the supply curve, below the price the seller receives. Well, um, the seller here is the minimum wage worker, right? Mm -hmm. And what price do they get for their labor? Well, 30. Right? Yeah. yeah, they get 30, right? So it's below this. So, and you notice here, right? See how it's how the, this graphical definition is slowly limiting the area. You can see like all of this is above the supply, but see this area over here, right? This is also below the price. See this like white yeah. uncolored triangle, right? Mm -hmm. So we're 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 still above and below, but we haven't limited it the area entirely. And then we say. Oh, to the left of the quantity traded, and that's our that's our last bit. And our quantity traded is down here, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So what's to the left of the quantity traded? Well, it's 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 you know all of this over here, right? I mean, this is to the left of the quantity traded too. Can you see where I'm? This little yeah. uncolored trapezoid, right? But, but if we put to those be... three to yeah, if we put those three together, it's above. Mm -hmm. It's to the left and it's below this price. And then you just end up with this is, and this is technically, I don't know if you know the difference between this big trapezoid here and this littler trapezoid here, what's the difference in, in the shape in terms of the name. But I don't know if this, this sounds um, good to you or not, but we call this one a right trapezoid because it has a right angle on one of the sides. Can you see it? Yeah, that makes sense. So, so this right trapezoid is the producer surplus, and then that little triangle up there, as you properly identified, is the consumer surplus. So, good job. And I'll just label it to make sure that everybody sees it. So I'll say PS with price for okay. So, so I guess kind of to, to recap, because we're just about finished. Does anybody have any questions about any of the stuff that I talked about today? No. Okay. So I'm going to...